for being here. And Dr. Sanjay Agarwal and their entire team of IDEC for having me here. This, uh, this <coughs> talk does have a duality and conflict of interest with Biocom. So what uh, Nita wanted me to talk on was that can we use Glargene? Can it be affordable? Can it be accessible? We are on the eve of uh, celebrating Atmanirbhar 75 years of independence. And uh, can we have independence and have affordable, accessible generic insulins, which are of quality in which we can use a term interchangeable. So that's the overarching theme of my talk. We know worldwide there's an explosion of diabetes. And uh, worldwide, uh, and including Southeast Asia, 1 in 10 or 1 in 11 adults, almost 90 million people are living with diabetes. In fact, nowadays we like to call everybody PW. D, P, W, O means people living with diabetes, people living with obesity. We don't like to use the word diabetic or obesity. And number of adults with diabetes is expected to go up to almost 113 million by 2030 as per the 2021 Atlas of IDF. And it will further go up to 151 million. The biggest challenge we have in our geographies of Southeast Asia, and I was in Solapur yesterday, is that every second adult with diabetes doesn't know that he has diabetes. It's undiagnosed. And the second distressing feature now is more than 7 million deaths are occurring because of diabetes. This has exponentially gone up from 4 million deaths. And more than $10 billion are spent on diabetes in 2021. So clearly we have an inertia. We are not hitting hard and hitting early. We clearly are seeing that in the uh, real-world treatment of diabetes, we are not able to get the A1C below 7%. We use a single agent, and the median time of intensification is 2.9 years. If you use two agents, the further delay in intensification occurs by around seven years. And from there, migrating them from two drugs to insulin is another seven or six years. So this is very, very common that somebody gets labeled as a person with type 2 diabetes, gets a drug or two or three, and then there is a lot of deferment, aversion, and some inertia to initiate and then intensify insulin. That's really the challenge. Remember, after 100 years of insulin discovery, very clearly we recognize that insulin is what our portal vein has. It's the most natural peptide on planet Earth to treat diabetes, more than 100 years old. It's strongly evidence-based, it's natural, it's safe. The only challenge with insulin is it has two rate limiting steps, hypoglycemia and weight gain. And that's why there is some degree of physician as well as uh, patient-related inertia to initiate insulin. But the idea is to give it early. Because if you give insulin early, it gives you benefits beyond glycemic control. It clearly gives beta cell rest, it reduces beta cell apoptosis, it reduces glucotoxicity and lipotoxicity, it has beneficial effects on lipid profile. So there is not only amelioration of insulin resistance, but better quality of life. So clearly we have that happening very clearly. And we also know that most of our type 2 diabetes, we diagnose them late, and already they have a faltered beta cell at diagnosis. So clearly there is a lot of data to suggest that this beta cell in diabetes, which is failing, can be preserved by early insulin initiation. And if you give that short-term intensive insulin therapy in the newly diagnosed type 2 diabetic, there is extraordinary data starting initially from Japanese literature, then from Chinese literature to show that you can actually induce a temporary remission. And this induction of beta cell rest, we also understand its mechanisms better now because it's all modulated through reduction of not only gluco and lipotoxicity, but the pro-inflammatory cytokines, the islet amyloids, the leptins, and even the beta cell mass can be modulated. We also have another intervention of beta cell rest, where the ATP-sensitive potassium channels, where drugs like disoxide, which are used in malignancy or hypoglycemia can be used, and we also know there are anti-apoptotic drugs, including glitazones and incretin mimetics and enhancers, which might have some evidence on the beta cell function. 
So clearly there is a need for early and timely insulin initiation. We know that diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, particularly in Indian geography, has a lot of insulin deficiency with it. There is no oral therapy, therefore it alters the decline in beta cell function. There's poor glycemic control, which is an important driver for complications of diabetes. Early insulin therapy is physiologically intelligent, will provide long-term health benefits for type 2 diabetic patients. So clearly that's something which we recognize. So clearly we have now documented data that if you use insulin early, it clearly preserves beta cell mass and function and the exhaustion of beta cells is overcome. And that early initiation of insulin aids long-term efficacy and complications of type 2 diabetes. So if you see good data, which is more than almost 19 years old, early addition of insulin prolongs beta cell function and prom promotes optimal metabolic control. And this has a spiral effect. We have excellent data from UKPDS to show that a simple drop of A1C by one percentage decreases deaths by 21%, microvascular complications by 37% or one-third, and myocardial infarction by around 14%. So clearly the data is clear-cut that if you intensively intensify diabetes therapy long-term, microvascular complications come down from UKPDS, cardiovascular disease and mortality also comes down. And in the type 1 diabetes space also, the data from DCCT and its follow-up from ADIC cohort is very clear-cut. So that data is very, very clear-cut. When we talk of ADA standards of care 2022, though this is 21 and the, the, the algorithm has not changed, clearly it recognizes that consider insulin as the first injectable if the glucose is above 300 or A1C is above 11%. So that's a clear no-brainer. Because that is the time catabolism is set in and there is weight loss. And the symptoms of hyperglycemia, which are osmotic in nature, are present. So if there are osmotic symptoms, weight loss, evidence of catabolism, or glucose, which is high at 300 or A1C above 11%, start insulin. The most physiological way to start is bedtime insulin at 10 p.m., 8 to 10 units. It's the easiest convenient option. Can be a perfect add-on to metformin and any other oral agent. As I said, you can start with 0.1 to 0.2 units per kg per day or around 8 to 10 units. And if patients are already on GLP-1 agents and if the baseline A1C is off target, you can actually co-combine them as well but you can reduce the doses of each agent. And remember, that's easily doable and feasible. So that's something which we recognize very well. RSSD came out with its own guideline on insulin initiation and titration of basal insulin. We know that if the A1C is below 8%, it's 0.1 to 0.2 units per kg. If it's above 8%, it's 0.2 to 0.3 units per kg. And then you can titrate it very simply. Every two to three days, if the fasting blood glucose is above 180, it's four units. 140 to 180 is two units. If it's 110 to 139, it's one unit. And if it's below 70, reduce the dose by 20%. If it is below 40, reduce the dose by 40%. So you can actually clearly titrate the insulin. So insulin is easy to use, and it is easy to initiate, and it's easy to titrate, particularly in the basal space. So that's very recognizable. The biggest challenge we have in countries and geographies like India is affordability. So affordability is a huge challenge. We know that if you look at worldwide data and look at the defined daily doses, the low and middle income countries have not been using insulin to its optimal volume. Whether it is India, whether it is China, you can see that the use of insulin is tremendously low because of the myths prevalent around it. So majority of the insulin global volume, which is produced by the three large manufacturers, and analogs represent 92% of the volume produced by the three large companies, and 8% by the other companies which make biobetters or biosimilars is there. So the biggest challenge <coughs> in diabetes care today is access. There are enough people in the world and it's really a shame, and I sit on the board of IDF, 
that even today as we talk in every geography across the world including developed countries like united states people can't afford insulin and type 1 children are deprived of insulin one of our ada presidents who was also the aha president was with us couple of years back and he actually he had twins he is himself a type 1 diabetic and his twins both had type 1 diabetes one was covered in one state in us with insulin and other one was not covered with insulin and he bought that insulin which was affordable from india and took it there so this is the challenge whether you are living in united states or whether you are living in poor geographies of africa south america southeast asia including our brothers and sisters from sri lanka they have challenges of insulin it has to be accessible it has to be affordable and that's the biggest challenge and that's why we want insulin to be accessible universally available and no type 1 child on planet earth should be deprived of insulin we have if you look at just data and this is data from the world diabetes day watch 30 million that is tens of thousands of people with type 1 diabetes who need insulin to survive and more than 30 million people with type 2 diabetes who require insulin to not have accessible reliable affordable continuity of supply this is the shame and we really need to make an effort to make insulin cost down us has led this movement india also has affordable access to insulin but we need to count down it 86% of people with type 2 diabetes don't have access to insulin forget the need for insulin need for insulin is there and 63% of households with low income countries are unable to afford insulin so that's really the overarching thing and look at insulin price it's really the insulin price which is very prohibitively high and there is no data to show that any of these analogs are superior really to the conventional insulins see the difference between nph and glargine was a one third reduction in hypoglycemia but between glargine and any of the advanced generation insulins we have not been able to document beyond reasonable doubt any data to show that the hypoglycemia is substantially reduced beyond reasonable doubt at best we have been able to document some degree of equivalence and this is why millions of people and i am not talking of the affordable people i am talking of people who are deprived are not able to access insulin because of the cost so that's something very well recognizable and we need to make an effort to do that why are we talking of interchangeable glycine because people have now this bogey that biosimilar is not up to the mark and that's not true at all we should be proud when we are celebrating 75 years of our independence that we have us fda approved interchangeable glargines available and approved by us fda japanese fda eu which are made in india and made in malaysia so clearly you can see if there's a reference glargine stabilized at 20 units reference per day the cost is around 52 rupees cost at the end of one year is 19000 rupees cost at the end of 5 years is 95000 rupees that can come down for the same interchangeable insulin by 5000 rupees and at the end of uh, you know 5 years 22000 rupees it matters if you ask me with the high inflation it clearly matters so timely initiation of interchangeable glargine makes an economic advantage and definitely should not at least make some dent i would not say the total dent some dent in accessing insulin to people who need it is there evidence now because the first thing the innovators ask is is there any evidence if you switch or you change is there data is there robust evidence to show beyond reasonable doubt that this interchangeable glargine is up to the mark and this is data on switching where in the us you know the chemist switches okay it is not even up left to the doctor to switch because they see the price they negotiate the price with the company unfortunately here we have it but it's important to recognize at the end of the day it makes a difference after 100 years of insulin discovery there is nothing patentable about it it has to be accessible and affordable for everybody 
and therefore us fda clearly says changing one medicine to another they should have the same clinical effect in the clinical setting and therefore they have protocols for interchangeability and therefore this term interchangeability is used and they do the switching studies for example biosimilar is an indian major and they have approved and approvals in major economies of the world whether it is a tga whether it's japan malaysia korea or whether it's interchangeability by us fda in 2020 in peak of covid times because you see now in the us also there is the affordable access act and clearly the president biden's team is recognizing the need in us on having insulin for everybody so clearly we have that data but it should not be just interchangeability it has to be documented by clinical trials and biocon has done those large gene trials seven clinical trials with more than 1900 plus patients in 20 countries across geographies one of those trials is the instride trial in type 1 diabetes where you can see head to head safety and efficacy of the glargine with reference insulin in instride one study which was presented at san diego way back in 2017 clear simple data okay showing very clearly that in the type 1 subject this was used for the us fda submission it is almost same there is nothing difference whether it's fasting a1c and clearly they concluded that there was no real difference from a basal bolus standpoint dates of hypoglycemia adverse event they were identical they were bio identical to say the least i would not make the claim for bio better they have a breast cancer drug which is approved by the us fda where it's actually a bio better it's doing better than the innovator because again cancer and diabetes are two therapies where cost to access is a huge challenge and that's really the challenge but in type 2 diabetes space also they have data which shows non-inferiority of the interchangeable biocons glargine with the innovator or the reference glargine and that data is also very clear cut similar data a1c is very very similar the change of difference between group is only 0 0.06 percent not significant at all and you can see the glargine dose also is almost same so there's absolutely no difference so whether it's a1c change whether it's fasting change whether it's rates of hypoglycemia it's almost the same but then the innovator will always cast doubt ki, is it immunogenic can it be challenging can you do the switches that easily in type 1 diabetes space and that data is also available the instride 3 study looked at that they did proper randomization robust diet design switching periods and they clearly saw that with the reference insulin they did those anytime hypoglycemias and they have that immunogenicity and safety data and clearly we recognize that the cost difference is clear cut so clearly the interchangeable glargine and its health economic impact is clear cut so the biggest challenge today we have for insulinization after 101st year we are at, at 101 year is we should move from the mindset that it is reserved for people who can afford to people who can be affordable with optimal therapy we should do timely insulinization and not late insulinization we need to make our world free from complications of diabetes and reduce morbidity and mortality and we need to do healthcare cost savings the economic burden is right from the individual to non-governmental organizations to the government to the insurers but we need to reduce that burden for that individual living with diabetes who needs insulin. So as I said, we now have a FDA approved first interchangeable biosimilar insulin in treatment of diabetes. This was the FDA announcement and we need universal access. So the whole idea is to have universal access. And therefore, my whole talk centered around a simple theme that in healthcare system today, we need safe, we need effective, but we need to add two more A's, affordable and accessible insulin, which is available and which is approved through the standard regulatory paths followed by the regulators. Thank you for a patient hearing.